Terrence Real, us, getting past you and me to build a more loving relationship. The lone genius at work in her studio, the tech whiz kid who took Silicon Valley by storm, the self-made millionaire who rose to the top of her industry without any hand-ups. Contemporary society valorizes the individual and their achievements, but in many ways, this individualism is toxic. On a broad level, thinking of ourselves as individuals rather than people who are networked within their community creates division and estrangement from the world we live in. On a more intimate level, it might also be causing lasting damage to your relationships. Relational therapy, which asks individuals to consider the ways others have shaped them and the way they've shaped others, seeks to move people beyond this individualistic mindset and it's particularly valuable for couples. When two individuals can set aside their you and me mindset and prioritize growing their relationship, they can create rewarding and lasting intimacy. Hey, so I'm Amanda and I'm going to be narrating this blink, but I wanted to give a quick disclaimer before we continue. So the advice in this blink is intended for couples in flawed relationships, but who are nevertheless committed to persevering healing, and making things work. It is absolutely not suitable for anyone in a toxic or verbally or physically abusive relationship. If you're coupled up, this scenario might be familiar. It begins with something trivial. Think a dish left unwashed in the sink. You ask your partner why they haven't cleaned it. They reply, "Mm, maybe a little snappily, they haven't gotten around to it yet. All of a sudden, you're both feeling tense defensive. Things escalate. Now, much bigger emotions are coursing through you. Rage, hatred, contempt. You're both yelling, dredging up old disagreements and hurling insults. Or you're giving each other the silent treatment, staring stony-eyed at each other. You've forgotten that the person you're fighting with is the same person who laughs at your jokes and holds you when you're sad. Your rational brain has left the building and all your worst emotional habits have kicked in and taken over. Why does this happen? Well, the field of interpersonal neurobiology, which looks at the individual's brain cognition in the context of her relationships with others, has some answers. The reason you and your partner are so good at driving each other crazy is that people in close relationships tend to co-regulate. That means when your partner's levels of the stress hormone cortisol spike, your cortisol levels are apt to rise too. Similarly, when your partner is relaxed, you're also likely to feel relaxed. That's part of the picture. But what about all those toxic emotional reactions that come into play when you and your partner disagree? Well, that too has a lot to do with your relationships with others. You learned your stress reactions whether they're to yell, lie, or retreat into silence in the context of your earliest relationships. For most of us, that means we absorbed the stress responses that were modeled by our families, and especially by our parents. When things are going smoothly, most of us are wise adults. We think with our prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain responsible for measured, complex cognition. We're rational, flexible, warm, forgiving we know that one dirty dish isn't the end of the world. But when we're under stress, another region of our brain, the amygdala, takes charge and stimulates a fight-or-flight response. In fight-or-flight, we are only concerned with self-preservation. We feel we don't have time to think things through, so we act on instinct. This is when the adaptive child emerges. Your adaptive child is a creature of emotional habit, using all the stress responses you learned when you were young. Whether your adaptive child is cruelly domineering, a people-pleasing doormat, or something in between, they are always rigid in their thought patterns and behaviors. Sometimes, when you and your partner fight, your wise adult selves leave the room, leaving two adaptive children. All of a sudden, your worst habits and most destructive emotional impulses are triggered. But hey, There is some good news. Just because your adaptive child automatically takes over doesn't mean it always has to be like this. 
scientists used to assume that the neural pathways of our brains were set in stone. These pathways calcified into habits, behaviors, and traits. In other words, our basic characteristics. If you were a person with a bad temper, that trait was set in stone. Now, though, scientists know that through the process known as neuroplasticity, neural pathways can rewire and reform. In other words, we are capable of phenomenal change. Let's go back to that dirty dish. When that fight spun out of control, you and your partner weren't acting as wise adults. Wise adults know preserving the relationship, the us, is more important than individual point scoring. Instead, you were two eyes battling it out. Here's what you need to know. When one eye wins, the loser is always us. But it is possible to break free from toxic behaviors, to approach conflicts as wise adults, to stop thinking in terms of I, and reframe your relationship in terms of us. Meet Dan and Julia. They've been married seven years, but lately Julia's been considering divorce. Dan's a nice guy, but he's always twisting the truth and making excuses. If he's ever five minutes late for dinner, it seems like he's got some wild story to explain his delay. And Julia is sick of it. But Dan just can't stop. All right, so Dan's dad left the scene when Dan was a toddler. His mom was strict and controlling. As a child, Dan was basically a good kid. But one single slip up and his mom would fly off the handle. Dan's habitual lying is actually an adaptive strategy he learned when he was young. Dan knew he could keep his mom from flying into a rage if he presented as a perfect kid all the time. And he learned to conceal the occasional adolescent slip-up by being flexible with the truth. But the strategies that served Dan well as a kid are about to torpedo his adult relationship. And hey, like Dan, lots of us carry our adaptive child with us. It's a normal response to our childhood trauma. And not necessarily trauma with a capital T, either. For the purposes of relational psychology, trauma is any event, big or small, repetitious or a one-off, that moves someone away from a healthy emotional response to a situation and prompts them, instead, to develop adaptive strategies. It's important to remember your adaptive child isn't bad. They're an important part of you. But, like any child, they need to be parented. The next time you feel your adaptive child take over, try not to let them determine your actions. Try, instead, to listen to what they're telling you. Let's get back to Dan and Julia. Spoiler alert, they didn't get divorced. But... Dan had to learn how to parent his adaptive child for their relationship to get back on course. And here's how he did it. So first, he identified his inner child's adaptive strategies and pinpointed their root cause. Therapy can help during this stage, but it's not a necessity. Then, he practiced what's called relational mindfulness. Mindfulness is the practice of regularly observing your sensations, thoughts, and feelings as they arise, without attaching any judgment to them. Relational mindfulness extends that neutral observation to your relationship with others. For Dan, this looked like taking a deep breath whenever the impulse to lie or deflect blame arose. Next, he worked on rewiring his neural pathways, with the help of the RESPECT test, Essentially, whenever he had a negative thought, he tried to ask himself if it failed to meet the basic standards of respect. Okay, so a thought like, I'll just tell Julia the store was out of milk instead of admitting I forgot to buy it. That doesn't demonstrate basic respect towards Julia. A thought like, it's pathetic the way I'm always lying and making excuses, doesn't demonstrate basic respect to Dan himself. Every time he slipped up, Dan reminded himself it's not you that's bad, it's your behavior. And that's true for your adaptive strategies too, by the way. You are not a bad person. You're just behaving badly. Sometimes. <laughs> anyway, by practicing mindfulness and working on rewiring his neural pathways, Dan had a breakthrough. He came home late from work one evening, and instead of spinning a story about a last-minute assignment from his boss, he told the truth. He'd gone out for a drink with his coworker and forgot to call. 
And then something crucial happened. Dan was expecting to get in trouble. He hadn't behaved perfectly. If his mom was still around, she would have been furious at him. But uh, newsflash, Julia is not Dan's mom. She didn't mind that he was late. In fact, she was thrilled he'd told the truth. Dan had what's known as a corrective emotional experience. He'd always lied because he'd learned telling the truth led to a negative outcome. Julia's positive reaction to his honesty helped him see how damaging and unhelpful his adaptive strategy had become. Though it certainly served him well in childhood, in his warm, loving, adult relationship, it just wasn't needed. So what does an individualistic romantic relationship have in common with a seesaw? Well, someone's always on top and someone else is always lower than them. When you're operating in a you and me consciousness, there's never balance and harmony. And here's the scary truth. It's all too easy to move from a you and me consciousness to a you versus me consciousness. Remember how, in stressful situations, you might bring your adaptive child rather than your wise adult to a conflict? Well, that's not the only thing you bring along. Often, you end up fighting with your core negative image of your partner. Basically, it's the cartoon villain version of your partner you create in your mind, comprising all their worst, most annoying traits. Does this version of your partner actually exist? No, they're a product of your imagination. But... When your relationship is going badly, you might feel like you wake up next to your core negative image of your partner every morning and go to sleep next to them every night. Not exactly the stuff romantic dreams are made of. And, uh, guess what? Your partner has a core negative image of you, too. In fact, you probably have a good idea of what that negative image looks like. Let's say you're a little disorganized, and that's really frustrating to your type A partner. When you miss important appointments, your partner's core negative image of you is triggered. You're thoughtless and entitled and spoiled and ah, the list goes on and on. And now you're riled up. You conveniently ignore that there's some truth to that image and opt to be outraged instead. How dare your partner think so little of you? You're getting the picture, right? I mean, the core negative image is completely unproductive. What's worse, it can be magnified around a particular issue, making it almost impossible to resolve conflict. All right, so let's look at a pretty standard situation. Alex wants to have more sex with his wife, Tracy. And Tracy feels like, well, when it comes to sex, Alex doesn't listen to her needs and desires. It's not an unsolvable problem until the core negative images come into it. Of course, Tracy will never want sex, Alex thinks. She's terminally frigid. Of course, Alex will never turn me on, thinks Tracy. He's completely insensitive. Once they've activated these images, Tracy and Alex are stuck. The solution to this problem is actually pretty simple. Tracy and Alex need to let go of the ego and start thinking about the eco, as in the ecology of their relationship. When you operate with an us consciousness, you understand that your romantic relationship is a space where you both live. Poisoning that ecology with toxic behavior hurts you just as much as it hurts your partner. Of course, in our individualistically oriented society, shifting into us consciousness is much easier said than done. So here are a few more concrete tips. Try and resist hanging on to your core negative image of your partner. It's a hop, skip, and a jump from he's so insensitive to the sentence construction that sends chills down a relationship therapist's spine. He always, or she never. Framing your partner's behavior as permanent and unchangeable means you've given up on resolving conflicts even before they arise. Try something called redistribution. What hurts you most in your partner's actions is often something you're secretly ashamed of in your own behavior. Say you hate your partner's hot temper, but respond with passive aggression. Well, that's just another form of rage. Owning up to shared flaws can help you move past them. Find the shared objective. You'd be surprised. Even bitter arguments often center on a shared goal. For Tracy and Alex, that goal is a more fulfilling sex life. Once the goal is established, shift the conversation. Instead of, I want more sex, Ask, 
how can we improve our intimacy? Remember, you can't have power with someone, only over them. Abandoning power struggles and point scoring is the best way to truly empower your relationship. Sometimes, something in our relationship breaks so dramatically that it's not just your partner, but your whole world that seems changed. Some traumas are so shattering, they reconfigure our reality entirely. The psychologist Ronnie Janoff Bullman describes it like this. You're standing in the kitchen when you lean against the wall and you sink right through it. You're not just wary of walls now, you're wary of everything. I mean, if you can sink through a wall, what else can you sink through? And yeah, it's the same when a crucial trust is broken with your partner. If they could do this to me, you think, what else could they have done? But there is a silver lining here. Once the reality of your relationship has shattered, you have a chance to reconstruct it. Every relationship will have a rock bottom moment, whether it's brought about by a single event like an affair or a gradual wearing down. If you and your partner hit rock bottom as you and me, now you have a wonderful opportunity to rebuild as us. Let's take a look at one couple that have just hit rock bottom. Dina and Juan have been together for 10 years, but Juan's just found out that Dina's been having an affair for the past two years. He's devastated and angry, but luckily he's open to working on things and Dina is too. The first tool their relationship counselor gives them is the feedback wheel, a four-part conversational structure developed by therapist Janet Hurley. Tell your partner, this is what happened. This is the story I'm telling myself about what happened. This is how I felt. And most importantly, this would help me heal. It's not enough to explain to your partner why you're hurting. You need to help them help you. In an individualistic mindset, you expect others to meet your needs. Thinking as part of an us, it becomes obvious that guiding your partner to better support you is something that helps them and you. Back to Dina and Juan. The feedback wheel helps them move through their broken trust. But that's not all. Juan also realizes he's brought some harmful internal narratives to their relationship. His father was hot-tempered and prone to violence. As a result, Juan's adaptive strategy is to keep the peace at all costs. Throughout his relationship with Dina, he's been telling himself that keeping his thoughts to himself keeps his relationship safe. In truth, his reserve has been keeping him from speaking up about issues that really bother him and pushing Dina away. He works on establishing a new narrative. My relationship with Dina is more fulfilling when I advocate for my needs. After the trauma of infidelity, Dina and Juan wanted to repair their broken trust. They ended up repairing so much more. Before infidelity, they were a you and a me. Now, they are an us. You've just listened to our blink to us, getting past you and me to build a more loving relationship by Terrence Real. Okay, so the most important thing to take away from all this is that within relationships, a you and me consciousness results in point scoring and power struggles. For real romantic fulfillment, let go of ego and embrace putting us before you and me. Helpful strategies for achieving this include parenting your adaptive child, letting go of negative core images, and implementing us-focused feedback. And uh, here's one last piece of advice. Be a safe space for your partner. If you're in the middle of a fight and you notice your partner's adaptive child is taken over, what should you do? Well, stop trying to win the argument and make yourself a safe space for your partner. It's when children feel unsafe that they first form their adaptive strategies. When your partner is comforted and back to their wise adult self, you can resume your discussion. Thank you so much for listening, and let us know what you thought of this content by giving the Blink a rating and leaving any other feedback that you'd maybe care to share. And in the meantime, I hope you enjoy other titles in our library, and I look forward to your attentive ears in the next Blink. Till then, bye.